Again, good afternoon, everyone. On the first item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and indeed answers. And uh, we now move to portfolio questions on social justice, communities and pension rights. Question one, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how building standards can be improved to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. Minister Marco Biaggi. Uh, for adaptation, recent changes to building standards guidance will increase the resilience of new buildings to the possible effects of climate change, in particular flood risk assessments, flood resilient construction, control of surface water at source and construction resilient to wind driven rain. For mitigation, energy standards being introduced in October 2015 will reduce carbon dioxide emissions by around 21% for new dwellings and 43% for new non-domestic buildings when compared to current standards. Thank you. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister for that. Is the Minister aware that uh, local Scottish source timber for buildings embeds more carbon than the import of photovoltaic equipment and that planners do not seem to give timber construction buildings preference? What assessment has been made to compare the cost of insulation properties of current mass-built conventional housing with the potential of mass-built wooden homes in our fight against fuel poverty and reducing heating costs for families across Scotland? Minister. Uh, through building standards, in terms of energy efficiency, no assessments have been carried out to compare the benefits of different types of construction materials. Generally, the mandatory standards don't favour one form of construction over another. This, in particular, helps to avoid any issues in terms of European construction products regulations, where favouring one form could be considered to be a barrier to trade. I'd hope uh, planners would be aware of this. Uh, it is recognised that current new build energy standards and supporting guidance already make a very significant contribution to mitigating fuel poverty. This contribution will be further increased in October 2015 when the next set are announced. Many thanks. Question two, Christina McKelvey. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to people facing poverty. Mr Margaret Burgess. We are committed to tackling the long-term long drivers of poverty through early intervention and prevention. That is why, over the lifetime of this Parliament, we plan to invest over £1.7 billion in affordable housing. It is why we are spending around a quarter of a billion pounds in fuel poverty and energy efficiency programmes over a three-year period. And it is why we have contributed to collective investment of over £274 million in the Early Years Change Fund. Further to this, the First Minister outlined a range of actions to tackle poverty and inequality in the programme for government. As part of that programme, we are having to provide over £104 million of devolved funding in 2015-16 to mitigate the welfare cuts being imposed by Westminster. Thank you. Christina McKelvey. <clears throat> Can I thank the Minister for that answer and, and welcome all of the measures that she's outlined in that answer. Would the Minister uh, agree with me that local authorities play a very important part in delivering some of these frontline services? And is she as horrified as me at South Lanarkshire Council's proposals to cut things like the COVID befriending services, funding to advice services, teacher numbers, nursery teacher numbers, and now the Council leader throwing the toys out the pram and refusing to set a budget when it comes to budget setting time? Minister. Yes. Uh, I mean, I would certainly agree with, with uh, Christina McKelvey that local uh, authorities have a responsibility in delivering the services and the, the local government settlement is a good settlement to do that. But individual local authorities are responsible for managing their own budgets and when doing so, they allocate the resources available to them according to local needs and priorities, while at the same time recognising statutory obligations. And we encourage councils to use their resources to address poverty and inequality, and we also encourage them to engage actively with communities in the democratic process of deciding their priorities for spending. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I ask the Minister if she recognises that 20% uh, that uh, families containing a, a disabled adult, 20% of them live in relative poverty, whereas for families without a disabled adult, the figure is only 14%. Can I ask whether or not the Minister has made an assessment of the impact of rising care charges on disabled adults in recent, in recent years, and in particular whether she promises to get rid of Scotland's unfair care tax? Minister. 
the Scottish Government, we have previously announced that that's something we are looking at with COSLA in terms of the care charges, but in terms of what this Government is doing to tackle poverty um, in disabled families and in other families, we have a whole programme outlined, our child po poverty strategy, the, the, what already announced to Christina McKelvey and what we are doing in general over the piece for poverty. And we are also continuing to do that with our social wage, which is helping uh, families with disabled children and families throughout Scotland. Thank you. Question three, Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with Dumfries and Galloway Council and Unison regarding equal pay claims from 2005. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. The presiding officer, equal pay for local government staff is the responsibility of councils as employers. The Scottish Government has therefore not had any engagement with the Dumfries and Galloway Council in unison about equal pay claims from 2005. Alex Ferguson. Um, well, I'm grateful for that uh, confirmation, but last week many classroom assistants and special needs assistants in Dumfries and Galloway received notification from their union of a settlement of, a long, of this long-running equal pay claim that it's been pursuing against the council. Inevitably, in such a rural area, many employees did not hear about the ability to claim, and I've already heard from a number of my constituents whose colleagues will receive sums ranging from a few hundred pounds to several thousand pounds, while they will receive nothing and have been told by the council that any further claims will be time barred. Now, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that this is not fair and it's most certainly not equal. So can he tell me if there are any steps the Government could take to intervene in this situation and I also wonder if he'd agree to meet with me to discuss it. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I absolutely agree with the Member and indeed in my own area, North Lanarkshire Council, a Labour controlled Council, they have spent thousands of pounds fighting the workers, fighting for equal pay. It's outrageous. Uh, and I'm more than happy to meet the member, and although I have very limited statutory responsibilities in this area, I certainly think maximum political pressure should go on all the recalcitrant local authorities who are not playing fair with their own employees. Many thanks. Question four, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it will support town centre regeneration in Dumfrieshire in 2015-16. Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, we published the Town Centre Action Plan one year on report last November. The report was debated in this chamber and sets out the range of actions we as a government are taking to support town centre regeneration. This includes expanding fresh start rates relief for small businesses, increasing opportunities for town centre living and agreeing the town centre first principles with COSLA. Local authorities are best placed to respond to the local needs of their communities and to work with them to develop the right vision for the town centres. The Town Centre Action Plan sets the conditions for this to happen. We call on the wider public, private and community sectors to take action to help address issues faced by our town centres. Dr Murray. Uh, thank, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Um, Regeneration initiatives invo involving community groups, housing associations and the local council are all underway in several towns and villages in my constituency, but I note that none, for example, have been successful in achieving funding through the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund. Can the Minister advise what support is available from government to support regeneration in smaller communities and what opportunities it provides to enable good practice in achieving funding to be shared? Presiding officer, I think one of the most successful initiatives ever undertaken by this parliament that had unanimous support was the Stone Centre Regeneration Fund, which spent £60 million, including in a number of projects in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and I ideally would like to rekindle that kind of project. Unfortunately, because of the capital cuts from Westminster, we have been unable to do so. But having said that, there are a range of funds, depending on the nature of the projects, which local groups can apply for. And I'm happy to ask my officials to send the member a list of all such funds that may be available for application. Thank you. Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government previously indicated that both the New Start and the Fresh Start relief schemes could support town centre regeneration. Yet, in a written question, I was told that data on the uptake of those schemes is not held centrally. How is the Government monitoring the effectiveness of the New Start and the Fresh Start schemes? Thank you. Presiding officer, as with normal with all of these schemes, from time to time we do a full-scale evaluation and we'll do that in cooperation with the local authorities involved. 
Uh, if we actually monitored everything centrally and collected all the information, we need another army of officials in order to gather all that information. It's much better to do a proper evaluation on a timious basis, either as part of a quinquennial review process or if a, a quinquennial review is too long to do it before a quinquennial review, but to do it as an independent evaluation task. Thanks. Question five, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on preventing youth homelessness. Minister Margaret Burgess. Preventing homelessness amongst young people is a priority for the Scottish Government, and this work is overseen by the Homeless Prevention and Strategy Group. We have seen a fall in homeless applications to local authorities from 16 to 24-year-olds from around 15,000 a year between 2003-04 and 2010-11 to under 9,000 a year during 2013-14, primarily due to the person-centred housing options approach being taken forward by local authorities. The Scottish Government also provides funding for a range of third sector projects working to prevent homelessness amongst young people. Man. The Minister will be aware that family breakdowns, addiction issues and mental health problems are most commonly behind youth homelessness. There is also an employability challenge for young homeless people as they are perceived. There is a perceived stigma attached to being homeless. Can the Minister outline what housing advice, information and support is being provided to these young people, particularly those who have been in care, to ensure their complex needs are being met? And in addition, what steps are the Scottish Government taking to improve the significant obstacles to employment, training and education which young homelessness homeless people face? Minister. Yeah. I mean, I think Siobhan McMahon outlines very well some of the difficulties that young homeless people are faced with. And the Scottish Government, that is the, the purpose of the housing options approach, is to look at the individual. It's a person-centred approach to look at all the circumstances around homelessness and that could prevent them being, homelessness, being homeless. And that includes providing support and a range of issues or referring on to, for example, addiction services, providing money advice support, and sometimes in uh, tenancy support within the, uh, their new tenancy. So all of that is provided. There is a duty in local authorities, a statutory duty, to provide um, support services and advice services to certain homeless people, and young people certainly come into that category. In terms of uh, young care leavers, um, we have strengthened the Young Persons Bill to ensure that they can uh, continue to get services and aftercare services up to age 26. And we're also working very hard, the homeless teams are working very hard in local authority areas to ensure that young people, there's a smooth transition moving from care to settled accommodation. Um, and it should be a planned process through the housing options approach and young people leaving care shouldn't have to make a homeless application. Many thanks. Question six, Rhoda Grab. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle uh, poverty in the Highlands and Islands. Minister Margaret Burgess. Okay. Uh, in reply to Christina McKelvey, I outlined the national approach we are taking to tackling poverty. However, the challenges of living in rural areas are well understood. Increased travelling and fuel costs and access to digital services can often have a greater impa impact in rural areas like the Highlands and Islands. We are working with others on research to share our understanding on how we can better target support to the rural areas of greatest need. In response to the Rural Scotland in Focus Report 2014, we are also refining socio-economic index tools that will better measure poverty and disadvantage across a rural area. This will help us to better target support to the rural areas of greatest need. Thank you. Rhoda Grant. Thank the Minister for that response. Um, she will be aware of the incredible 139% increase in claims to the Scottish Welfare Fund in Highland last year. She will also be aware um, of that the, the cost of buying basics is much higher in rural areas, including heating fuel costs that she mentioned. This means that fuel poverty is much higher in off-gas grid areas. Will she reinstate targeted fuel poverty funding and ensure that that assistance is available off-gas Grid. Minister. In terms of the, the Scottish Government uh, heaps projects to tackle fuel poverty, that was based on areas of deprivation, rurality, um, as well as the numbers of people in fuel poverty, and rural areas did uh, get extra funding last year for that. We recognise very much there is a problem in the off-gas uh, grid areas, and we have made this case to the UK Government on more than one occasion. 
We, Fergus Ewing has also written to the UK govern, government uh, about the price of fuel in the rural areas uh, and asked that that be looked at as well. And I wrote to Ed Davey um, asking about the warm, that asking him to increase the warm uh, homes discount and to ensure it's paid out of central funds and to consider how it impacts in rural, rural areas. And while they're not going to in increase the warm homes discount and the new scheme for that, they certainly have taken on board that rural areas there is a, a greater problem and the Scottish Fuel Poverty Forum sits on that working group. Thank you. Briefly, Mr Thompson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the 2p per unit electricity surcharge in the Highlands and Islands contributes a fair bit to poverty in my constituency. Will the Minister be responding to my energy survey, which showed that 95% rejected the 2p surcharge and that nearly 99% of the 1,700 replies I received backed public ownership of electricity production and supply? Minister. As I said in my previous answer, the government is concerned about the level of the energy bills throughout the country, but especially in the north of Scotland. And Fergus Ewan has raised the issue of the high electricity bills and charges with the chief executive of Ofgem directly and has written to the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. He's highlighted our concerns about the impact of the current charging arrangements and the apparent slow progress in terms of Ofgem's further investigation into the matter and will continue to press for a timely and effective solution. Many thanks. Question 7, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will support and develop the third sector across the South Scotland region. Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises the critical role the third sector plays in addressing issues of inequality and the needs of disadvantaged communities and is committed to supporting the sector across Scotland, including the south of Scotland region. The 2015-16 Scottish Government budget will enable us to continue to significantly invest in the third sector as a key social partner, maintaining funding of £24.5 million towards direct support of the third sector. Jim Hume. I thank the, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, response. He may be aware that funding difficulties encountered by Action on Hearing Loss Scotland has meant that the excellent Here to Help initiative is coming to an end in March across Ayrshire and Arran uh, and the borders. Uh, we also know uh, that service users potentially face isolation without the support of Here to Help. So as we move towards integrating health and social care, uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that health boards need to look at their services to ensure that best use is made of the extra reach and resource that, that the third sector, such as Action on Hearing Loss Scotland, provides in supporting people with hearing loss in their communities. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, obviously health boards and the new partnerships need to take care of the priorities and uh, clearly assisting people with hearing difficulties has got to be a priority. Although, can I just gently say that if his colleague Danny Alexander hadn't sliced the Scottish budget to the extent he has done by 10% in the resource budget, we would have far more money to help the third sector, not just in the south of Scotland, but throughout the whole country. Thank you very much. Question 8, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to help bring empty properties back into use as housing. Mr Margaret Burgess. We are bringing empty properties back into use through support of the shelter-led Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, the £4.5 million empty, empty Homes Loan Fund and other funding programmes. Scotland's network of empty homes officers has reported that over 500 empty homes will have been brought back into use in 2014-15, and that's up 278 in 2013-14. We have recently extended the partnership for a further three years, and at the end of which we expect 1,200 homes per annum to be brought back into use. We are also finalising details of a new £4 million town centre empty homes fund to provide grant and loan funding to increase the supply of housing. This will focus on both problem empty homes, which causes a blight on their community, and on conversion of empty commercial spaces into residential accommodation. Thank you very much. Mike McKenzie. I thank the Minister for that answer. As she will know there are significant rural housing pressures can she indicate what action has been taken to bring empty properties back into use in rural areas? Minister. Okay. I can say to the member that action has been taken across Scotland to bring empty homes back into use 
And I saw a great example firsthand in a rural town of Kirrimuir, where the Empty Homes Loan Fund helped turn a disused church hall into nine units of affordable housing. There are further Empty Homes Loan Fund projects in rural areas, and the Town Centre Housing Fund will also welcome bids from rural towns. Many thanks. Uh, we now have to move to a different portfolio of fair work, skills and training. Question one, Alison McInnes. Thank you very much. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to improve access to modern apprenticeships for disabled young people. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce recognised the need for more action to support young disabled people and made specific recommendations towards achieving this. In response, Developing the Young Workforce Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy sets out the framework for how we intend to tackle the, this issue. For example, Skills Development Scotland is working with Bernardo's, uh, Remploy and training providers to increase take-up of modern apprenticeships by disabled young people. Uh, Skills Development Scotland have also met with BC Resources for Inclusiveness in Technology and Education and with Capability Scotland to discuss ways in which the accessibility of their My World of Work web service can be improved going forward to ensure that it is accessible to all customers. Alison McInnes. I thank the Minister for her answer. I, I would note that with less than 0.5% of modern apprenticeships secured by disabled people, we have a long way um, to go. The commission uh, that the Minister mentioned also um, highlighted that the learner journeys of young disabled people are often disjointed and can take a long time to complete. Uh, and it concluded that funding levels and funding rules should be adjusted to give them the best possible chance of succeeding. Uh, will the Minister update us on what adjustments have now been made to those funding levels and funding rules? Will you? Uh, well, I would say to the member that the, uh, the specific uh, recommendations incorporated in the Refreshed Youth Employment Strategy are being actively worked upon. And I mean, it may interest the member to note that there are a number of uh, funding streams, uh, so some £3 million has been allocated directly in response to the recommendations of the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce to address wider underrepresentation across our employability programmes. The Scottish Government has also provided £2 million for the targeted employer recruitment incentive to facilitate transitions to sustainable employment. There is also, of course, presiding officer of the Community Jobs Fund, which the Scottish Government delivers in partnership with the SCVO, which creates targeted opportunities for those who face additional barriers to employment, including uh, those with a disability. I would say to the member that, of course, there is always more that can be done, and the Scottish Government is determined to do all that we can to improve access on the part of disabled people to apprenticeships and therefore to the world of work. Many thanks. Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, ministers outlined the Scottish Government's plans to tackle underrepresentation on the modern apprenticeship programme. But does she agree that what dis disabled people crucially need is adequate money to live on in the first place and therefore continuous welfare cuts from successive UK governments are holding back disabled people completely? Minister. Um, I, I would say to the member that it is clear, uh, and as a former member of this Parliament's Welfare uh, Reform Committee, that the UK government's changes to the welfare system are continuing to cause hardship for a significant number of people in Scotland, with disabled people suffering disproportionately. That is unacceptable, presiding, offer, uh, presiding officer. And whilst the Scottish government will continue to do what it can uh, to help those most affected, it is clear that uh, whatever the exact nature of the powers that may come to this Parliament, they will come with a 20% cut uh, across the board imposed by Westminster. Sadly, presiding officer, for the Westminster party, spending £100 billion on new nuclear weapons takes precedence over providing a safety net to some of the most vulnerable people in our country. Thank you very much. Question to Mary Fee. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will roll out the work programme once it has devolved. Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, following the publication of the UK Government's command paper, we are taking forward discussions with the UK Government through the Joint Ministerial Group on Welfare uh, on the devolution of the work programme and the other employment services currently contracted by the DWP. Meaningful devolution of those services could indeed provide an opportunity to offer far greater support into work for the unemployed and especially those who face the greatest barriers uh, to work in Scotland. And once we have greater clarity from the UK Government on the details of its legislative proposals, we will engage with colleagues across the Chamber and civic society to ensure we maximise the opportunity that is therefore afforded uh, within our uh, future services. Mary Fee. 
Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And as the Cabinet Secretary will know, many companies are desperately looking for young people to work in the science, technology, engineering and mathematics sectors. So can the Cabinet Secretary um, tell me how the work programme can be used to boost opportunities within STEM? Well, with the greatest uh, of respect to the member, we don't yet know what will be available to us uh, within the work programme and the devolution thereof. And the, the things that she is discussing will be a matter for us to consider uh, once we are aware of exactly what is going to be available. At present, it does look as if the, the, what is proposed will only be uh, in terms of the longer term unemployed, uh, those over a year. Uh, and uh, there are some restrictions in terms of uh, the, the disabled as well. So until we're actually aware of what uh, uh, we are going to be able to do in terms of powers, it's very difficult to answer specific questions, but I have given a commitment to come back to this chamber once we know the detail uh, and to engage with people on specific aspects. John Mason. Uh, thank you. I, I wonder if the, uh, we can have any guidance as to what scope the Scottish Government has to go uh, down a different route from Westminster, given that uh, the work programme contracts, as I understand it, have been extended despite uh, the Smith Commission recommendations. Well, um, in, in, in some senses, my answer to the member is similar to the answer I've given uh, uh, to uh, Mary Fee. Um, the, there does look as if there may be some scope to redesign services for the long-term unemployed in Scotland, uh, which would better align future delivery with the government's policy objectives. But limitations do, as we understand at present, uh, currently exist primarily uh, conditionality and sanctions which will remain reserved to the UK government. The UK government command paper, for example, limits the devolution of contracted services to those lasting over a year, which appears to unduly restrict the further devolution uh, of any services. So we do continue to discuss uh, the position on the work programme extension in Scotland through the Joint Ministerial Welfare Group. We will press for a resolution which meets the needs of the unemployed in Scotland and does deliver the spirit and letter of, of Smith. But it is a little premature for me to be able to go into the detail that members undoubtedly want to know. In six, uh, question three in the name of Jamie McGregor has not been lodged. Uh, a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question four, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to establish a future jobs fund for Scotland. Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, this government has already invested in a wide range of employment initiatives which are available from day one of unemployment and are directly helping to move our young people into sustainable employment opportunities. Through Youth Employment Scotland Fund, we're providing support in partnership with local authorities to move 10,000 young people into sustainable employment. And through our Community Jobs Scotland programme, we have supported over 5,000 young people into job training placements in the third sector. As the Chamber is aware, we also recently published the Developing the Young Workforce Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy, which presented our refreshed youth employment strategy. Given all of this work, uh, there are no current plans to establish another jobs fund in Scotland. Thank you. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I would ask if she is aware of North Lanarkshire Council's youth investment scheme, uh, where the Council have invested £7.5 million over the past three years to secure 5,000 jobs for young people in my region. Does the Scottish Government have any plans to investigate the success of North Lanarkshire Council's scheme and uh, have any plans to roll out across Scotland? I, I would always want to investigate any schemes that, that are brought to my attention because uh, it is important if we see successful schemes and by the sound of it this one may very well be uh, that we consider whether there are the lessons that can be learned in other uh, areas but of course that is a decision that local authorities can take and lo other local authorities are uh, equally as able to look at the success of that scheme and consider it for their own areas as well as the government looking at it. But I will engage with the member on the specifics of that if, if he wishes to discuss it further. Any thanks. Question five, Nanette Milne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government for progress it's making on implementing the recommendations of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. We are making good progress against the milestones set out in our implementation plan developing the Young Workforce, Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy, which of course was published in December 2014 and which has already been the subject of uh, uh, some of my responses. I'm particularly looking forward to the inaugural meeting of the National Advisory Group tomorrow, uh, which I shall share, chair jointly with Councillor Douglas Chapman, COSLA spokesperson for Education, Children and Young People, and where we will discuss progress. 
I thank Annette the Cabinet Mills. Secretary for that answer. The Commission recommends that the Scottish Government work with its proposed new Apprenticeship Sur Supervisory Board to ring-fence a proportion of all modern apprenticeship starts for STEM frameworks. It also recommends that this proportion should be significant and above the current level, and that STEM apprenticeships should be actively promoted to employers and young people. Given that the oil and gas sector is facing a significant level of retirement amongst its workforce, what discussions have taken place with the industry to plan for future workforce needs, and how many STEM apprentices Apprenticeships does the Scottish Government envisage going forward? Okay, well, the delivery of apprenticeships in Scotland, of course, requires a partnership to take place between employers, colleges and, uh, and schools. Uh, and STEM uh, apprenticeships, uh, engineering apprenticeships, IT apprenticeships are all uh, something to which we afford a great deal of priority. As the member is aware, there are a great many conversations taking place at the moment uh, in respect of the situation uh, in the northeast of Scotland. And it is important, I think, that all employers, uh, including those uh, in, in areas such as the northeast, engage actively in the work that we are doing uh, because apprenticeships require employers to take on the apprentices, but also employers to continue to offer uh, jobs. Uh, uh, the specifics of the regional difficulties that can arise, such as have arisen in the North East, uh, I hope will also be addressed through our uh, Invest in uh, Young People groups, uh, and uh, I hope uh, at some point in the near future to be discussing uh, a regional one in respect of the North East of Scotland, and that will be a prime area of discussion there. Many thanks. Question six, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages engineering apprenticeships. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, through Skills Development Scotland, we have exceeded our ambitious target to deliver over 25,000 modern apprenticeship starts each year, with 77,402 new opportunities delivered over the past three years. The number of apprentices starting engineering frameworks has gradually increased in recent years. There were almost 500 more engineering apprentice starts in 2013-14 than in 2010-11. In August 2014, Skills Development Scotland published the Skills Investment Plan for the Engineering and Advanced Manufacturing Sector. Uh, developed in partnership with industry, the uh, Skills Investment Plan provides the necessary blueprint for addressing skills supply issues within the sector, including a specific action to better meet employer demand through the promotion of modern apprenticeships in engineering. Linda Fabiani. Um, may I thank the Minister for that answer, which I'll have to read very closely because there was so much in there. And uh, can I ask whether the Minister is aware of the excellent work of East Cobride Group Training Association and that recently um, the first two apprentices in sign making ever trained in Scotland entirely through the good work of the Training Association and their respective employers um, received their certificates. And can I ask um, that she and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary too visit East Kilbride Group Training Association during Apprenticeship Week to see the innovative work that's carried out there. Sir? Uh, well, I, I, on the uh, kind offer extended of a visit, I'm always very happy to visit any uh, examples of, of local good practice, uh, whether it's during Apprenticeship Week or not would depend upon my existing direct commitments, but uh, I will ask my office to be in touch with, with the member. And I would like to take this opportunity, I did see the member's early day motion, to uh, offer my congratulations, presiding officer, to these young apprentices who have completed their sign-making apprenticeship, and I wish them the very best for their future careers. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of private training providers such as East Co East Bride Group Training Association in supporting the government's ambitions for the modern apprenticeship programme and indeed the ambitions of our young people. And uh, the earlier target uh, that we have already exceeded that I referred to, presiding officer, uh, is not uh, where we're going to sit because we have set a further more ambitious target of 30,000 modern apprenticeship starts uh, by 2020. Many thanks. Question 7, Patricia Ferguson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that the Glasgow Curriculum and Estates Plan's proposed transfer of activity to the city centre does not have a detrimental effect on the training needs of people from deprived communities in Maryhill and Springburn. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Glasgow College's Regional Board is responsible for planning college provision that meets the needs of learners and employers, and it is a legal duty to exercise its functions with a view to improving the economic and social well-being of the city. We understand the Glasgow Curriculum Plan proposes a 2.5% increase in activity in community locations, including access level courses, supporting more students who live in the most deprived areas, those with low or no qualifications, and those furthest from the labour market. Thanks. Um, Patricia Ferguson. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And indeed, the information about the access courses is very welcome indeed. But there is a great deal of uncertainty has been caused by a lack of clarity in this particular plan, as it suggests that some specialties or some skills and training opportunities will not be available in the local communities where they're most needed. I'd be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary was able to reassure me that that uh, unwanted scenario will not, in fact, transpire. The colleges have carried out, uh, in Glasgow, have carried out an extensive review of the region's uh, curriculum offer uh, and a wide range of stakeholders have already been consulted on the plan and the regional board has endorsed the direction of travel. Now, it is an ambitious plan uh, that does recognise the collective resources available in Glasgow, uh, but the aim is not for the transfer of activity to take place until August uh, 2015. Um, there is a huge opportunity for college education in Glasgow to be the jewel in the crown, and it's important that the many positives for learners and employers aren't overshadowed by uh, difficult questions such as being raised by, quite rightly, uh, by the member. But uh, overall, colleges have always delivered very strongly for deprived communities in Scotland. So I'm hoping to, to be able to reassure the member that that will continue to be the case in, in Glasgow. Uh, uh, students from deprived areas do benefit from free full-time education and record bursary support. Uh, and the records for, uh, the results for colleges do speak for themselves. Uh, Two-thirds of those from the 20% most deprived areas studying for recognised qualifications at college successfully completed their course uh, up on 2012-13. And the latest figures show that 26.6% of students do come from the 20% most deprived areas. And that's the backdrop against which the particular plan that the member is talking about will be set. Uh, and I would hope that fairness will always be a major consideration, regardless of what aspect uh, of the uh, uh, rollout we're talking about. Thank you. Question 8, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it, what it is doing to promote the IT industry as a career choice. Thank you, Rosanna Cunningham. Um, an underpinning theme of the ICT and Digital Technology Skills Investment Plan, which was published in March 2014, is to raise the profile of careers in the IT sector. Uh, to help achieve this, Skills Development Scotland is working in partnership with the industry on a multi-channel marketing campaign aimed at highlighting the opportunities available through a career in IT. Uh, this campaign will begin in spring 2015 and will complement the wider careers information, advice and guidance already available through my world of work and I hope that answer is also of interest to Nanette Milne. Many thanks. Claire Adamson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Cabinet Secretary may be aware of an event last week hosted by Oracle Academy entitled Future Job Framework, which is presented from the Oracle Academy and New College Lanarkshire in my region on their joint working. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree this is an excellent example of the IT industry engaging with local colleges and in so doing expanding the knowledge and opportunities of, for IT in Scotland? Yes, I, I can agree with the member. This type of collaborative working is a step in the right direction in terms of ensuring those entering the labour market are equipped with the right knowledge and skills that such a fast-paced and dynamic sector requires. The Scottish Funding Council is currently supporting seven early adopter college regions to explore and develop senior phase vocational pathways and focusing on STEM and sectors of regional importance. This activity will bridge the gap between school, college, university and employment for 15 to 18 year olds. And the pilot projects from Skills Development Scotland will begin to improve representation, will identify best practice that can be shared and re replicated. And it is of interest that one of these pilots is indeed a partnership project in West Lothian to encourage women into STEM subjects. Thank you. Question nine, John Pendle. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that the agency and contract staff it employs enjoy fair terms and conditions. Well, agency staff are not sorry. Well, go, sorry. Agency staff are not directly employed by the Scottish Government. Uh, the agency staff suppliers are responsible for pay and other terms and conditions of service. Scottish Government works with them, however, uh, through the, throughout the contract period to ensure that the very uh, best terms of supply uh, are available. Pentland. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response, but can the Minister tell me how many people employed by the Scottish Government contractors and subcontractors are employed using so-called umbrella company contracts? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, it would be difficult to establish the exact figure because the nature of those contracts means that people are set outside the normal employment patterns. And I am aware that there is a members' debate uh, uh, this evening precisely on this subject. It has been a matter of some uh, concern. I have a meeting uh, in respect of the umbrella contract position this afternoon and another meeting that has been uh, rescheduled uh, with the uh, Labour frontbench spokesperson on this. Uh, all of these unfair uh, or unacceptable uses of uh, contracts such as the umbrella contracts are ones that we would wish to discourage where possible. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12226 in the name of John Swinney on the Budget Scotland number 4 bill.